Hi everyone, this is the last part of the cognition unit. It will focus on the final part of intelligence, which is intelligence testing and psychometrics. Uh, in this video, we will start with the history of testing for intelligence, and we'll start with people who influenced the testing of intelligence. So the first person is Sir Francis Galton, and Sir Francis Galton understood that the intelligence of humans is uh, highly heritable, which means uh, the heritability of intelligence means to what extent can we attribute our ment mental abilities to our genes. And uh, we do know that there is a genetic component related to our intelligence. Uh, but Sir Francis Galton, he supported the idea that we should move towards creating a more intelligent race. And he called this movement the eugenics movement. And the eugenics movement was just essentially that uh, you would try to move a population to become generation after generation more intelligent through the sterilization of the less intelligent, meaning making those or identifying those who were less intelligent and then sterilizing them so that they could not reproduce and pass on their genetic material on to uh, more generations. So this is highly unethical. But during that time period, it had far reaching effects. This influenced the United States as well, and it pushed forward a eugenics movement in the United States through the 20th century. And during that time period, 60 to 70,000 Americans uh, were sterilized, meaning they were made unable to reproduce for many different reasons. And one of those reasons was being feeble-minded or being less intelligent. And so this pushed forward this movement. It influenced Adolf Hitler in Nazi Germany, which is when the United States started to distance itself from this movement. So this is one very negative aspect of identifying and finding intelligence. The next person in history we're gonna learn about is Alfred Binet. And Alfred Binet was uh, commissioned by the French government to identify which children needed intervention in the school system. So in the late 1800s, France uh, passed a law to make all children required to go to school. And so they were posed with an issue of students all across the board having different ability levels. And so his job was to identify uh, which students needed that help and support. And so what he targeted was finding children's mental age. And so he created an assessment to find their mental age. Now, Alfred Binet, his whole purpose was intervention for schooling and to help children be successful at school. So he would have never wanted this to be used, the scoring to be used as labels of labeling children more or less intelligent. He just wanted to identify who needed help. This is going to lead into a man named Louis Terman, and Louis Terman was an American, and he took uh, the, the, the Binet's way of finding mental age, and he turned this into a score or an intelligence score, something that Alfred Binet would not have been uh, excited about, something he did not want. He didn't want this turning into labels of intelligence. But Louis Terman uh, worked at Stanford and he took this and created this into a test in which was an intelligence test with a score that would rate or uh, uh, would, would identify your intelligence. And so he used this formula, mental age, divided by chronological age times 100, and this would equal your intelligence quotient or your score of intelligence. And this test he called the Stanford Binet because he was using this way of identifying mental age. Now, if you were average for your age, say a child, an eight-year-old child had a mental age of eight years old, multiply that by 100, their score would be 100. So 100 represented average that you are at your, your level for your, um, your mental age matches your chronological age. Now this uh, test is going to be used in different ways in the United States when it is first formulated. It was used in ways that were negative. For example, they use this test uh, to identify who should and should not be uh, uh, 
a soldier in World War One. This was administered to immigrants coming in the United States and was used to uh, limit the immigration in 1924 of who could enter the United States. And so it was used in ways that were uh, today would definitely have been considered unethical. So the next person we're going to talk about is David Weishler, and David Weishler came up with the most widely used test today called the Weishler Adult Intelligence Scale, and this is the IQ test given to adults. Now the Stanford Binet is still used today, but the most widely used is the Weishler Adult Intelligence Scale, or the WACE. He also has a, a format for children called the WISC, which is the Weishler Intelligence Scale for Children, and the WISPY, which is the Weishler Preschool and Primary School Intelligence Test, and these are for children, but uh, a formatted test for, uh, for their age. And he uses subtests, as you can see on the screen, you can pause and see what those different subtests are, and they would come together for a whole composite score. So on this screen, we have examples of questions that could be on on the WISC test. So you can see the first question. This is a question that would be asking for a reasoning. So you would ask the children which one of these is the same. And so we're looking, it's kind of like this weight scale, what would um, even out the weights? What could I put here? The second question is another reasoning style question. And this is a filling in the pattern. So you would ask the child, do you see the figures in these boxes? Which would complete the pattern? And then you would have them choose from the section below, which would complete the pattern. So a lot of reasoning and problem solving would go into some of these questions that the children would be asked on the WISC. The next slide is going to help us understand the difference between types of tests. So an aptitude test is uh, the same type of test that an IQ would be, an, or an IQ, I, I'm sorry, would be an example of an aptitude test. An aptitude test, their purpose is predicting future performances, whereas an achievement test is showing past learning. So an achievement test would be something that you do in school, you're showing your knowledge of what you've learned up until this point, so we're focusing on the past. Aptitude tests are focusing on the future. We're trying to predict how well you will do on something, on your future performances. So uh, they're just a little bit different in what they're assessing. So an IQ is looking at this predicting your problem solving abilities rather than an achievement test that you're studying for and it's this past knowledge and information. So an achievement test is designed to assess what someone has learned whereas an aptitude test is de designed to predict future performance. So there's a few other words on here that are important for you to know. Valid, if a test is valid, it means it's measuring or the score reflects what it is supposed to be testing. So that would mean if you scored on an intelligence test really low because maybe you didn't understand the questions, maybe it was your English abilities, or maybe there were some cultural things that you didn't understand about the test taking procedures. And if those things were making it difficult for you to answer the questions, then maybe that test was actually testing your English ability and your cultural knowledge. So with IQ tests, they work really hard to make sure that those barriers are not there. Um, same thing with the AP test. If you're having a hard time reading the question, uh, it could be testing your reading level and not so much your knowledge of AP psychology. So a test is valid if it the score represents what it's supposed to be testing. A test is reliable if you will get consistent results if you have taken that multiple times. So if it yields consistent results every time, we would say it's reliable. A test would be really unreliable. For example, if you took the ACT test and the first time you got a 32, and you took it six months later and you got a 15. That would be a really unreliable test. Typically with the ACT, you're going to fall around a, a few points um, difference than the time before, and maybe you'll slowly increase in small increments, but you shouldn't have that big of a discrepancy. A reliable test should yield consistent results every time. A standardized test is a test that has been uniformed. So the format, the procedures, they're utilizing this uniformity so that everyone taking it has the same um, questions and style um, so that they can be compared to one another to determine those scores. 
So next we have the normal curve or the bell curve. And so I'll explain this to you using this diagram here. So these are IQ scores and you can see on the low end, we have below 55 over here. And on the high end, we have above 145. And you notice that it gets really high in the middle. What that means is there were a lot of people scoring here in the middle. So your mode means the most or that the number that occurred most often was 100. And it's also the median. It falls right in the middle of all the scores. And this happens to also be the mean. And when that occurs, you get a bell curve that is higher in the center and smaller on the sides. So you can see fewer people were over here scoring in the 40s than in the center, and fewer people were scoring in the 150s than here in the middle. And so that's what has happened. We use a measurement tool called standard deviation. And with standard deviation, there are three units across to the right of average and three units across to the left of average. And what that's showing us is it's showing us the distance from the scores from average and how spread apart the scores are from average. So if we had people scoring out here in the 200s and down here near one and zero, it would spread our scores out and it would make our standard deviation unit here wider. But what we know is that with standard deviation, 68% of the population is going to score one, devi one standard deviation above and below. So most of your people, when you are looking at their scores for IQ testing, most people will fall between 85 and 115. So that's where your biggest population of tests are going to be uh, falling right in there around average. Now you are going to get some people who are falling out here in the extremes. If if someone is falling below a 70, that would be considered an intellectual disability. That would be someone who is um, just having some limitations on what they're able to do with their mental abilities and processing. Anything of a 130 and above would be considered gifted. And so anytime you start getting really far away from the average population, there usually is going to be some need for intervention whether that be special education intervention and help with some social skills, um, 70 and below, or whether that be gifted intervention, which would be giving um, and, and allowing for more challenging work, or even some help with the social skills on the other end of the spectrum. So that is where we see some of these needs for intervention when, when people start getting farther away from average. There is another term in this unit that goes along with this section, and that is Down syndrome. Now, down syndrome isn't the same as an intellectual disability. It's kind of in its own category. They could go together, but they, they don't have to. They can stand alone. So down syndrome is a specific condition that is caused by an extra chromosome. It is the chromosome 21. And so an individual with this condition would experience anywhere from mild to severe intellectual impairments. And that is just another term that goes along with this section. So now we're gonna move into the dynamics of intelligence and how intelligence changes over time. There are two types of intelligence that we'll refer to here. One is fluid and one is crystallized. Fluid intelligence just refers to the reasoning and ability to think abstractly, like problem solving. Those are things that actually decline with age and become more challenging with age. Crystallized intelligence is just your knowledge for information, and this is a lot of times dependent on your experiences and what you're exposed to throughout your life and your vocabulary and how that grows, and that actually grows with time. So typically, we're going to see that increase with time. There are two more concepts to know. One is called the Flynn effect, and the Flynn effect is a worldwide phenomenon that shows that the average intelligence over time is growing year after year, that we are getting essentially smarter. Now, what they believe is that the Flynn effect, they believe, is caused by a few different things, that we have better health, we have better nutrition, we have more, better access uh, to education, and we have a rising standard of living across uh, just globally, and which is what they believe to be the increase. And maybe just even exposure to testing situations and having familiarity with that. The last one is the stereotype threat. And the stereotype threat is a self-fulfilling issue where when one person believes that they're being evaluated on something that maybe 
maybe represents a negative stereotype for that person, whether it be their gender or whether it be their race, they tend, their, their score tends to reflect that negative stereotype. Now, if they're not aware of, uh, if, they're, if they're not aware that they're being tested on this particular stereotypical uh, content piece, then it doesn't impact their score. Over 300 studies have been published that show the strength of the stereotype threat, and the stereotype threat is considered to be one of the biggest contributing factors to the racial and gender achievement gaps. You can take a second and look at these charts to see how that works itself. I would love to talk more about this topic, but I'm running out of time. I hope this was helpful in understanding intelligence, how it's tested, what we've learned about it over time, and good luck on the cognition test.